on World News Tonight. High stakes visit. U.S. Secretary of State and Defense met with Ukraine's president, marking the highest level of American officials to visit since the war began. Decisive victory. France wakes up to a five more years of Macron presidency and Emmanuel Macron beats the far-right candidate. Wildfire outbreak. Fires whip across the plains of Nebraska, killing one and injuring nearly a dozen and hundreds remain evacuated. And honoring the veterans. Curtailed commemorations written on Anzac Day after the COVID pandemic. This is Ada Derana World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here is Suzanne Chanelli. Good evening and thank you for joining us on World News Tonight. Now, as the Russian attack on Mariupol continues, Ukrainian authorities have made an offer to Moscow to hold talks near the city's steel plant, saying that over 20,000 people have been killed in Mariupol alone. The city's mayor said that they are witnessing the greatest war crime of the 21st century. Ukraine has made an offer to Russia to hold a special round of negotiations in the city of Mariupol, which is under serious attack by Russian forces. Ukraine's presidential office said Sunday that the negotiations would be aimed at discussing the fate of Ukrainian civilians and troops still trapped in the city. It also suggested that the negotiations be held near the Azovstad steel plant, which is the last holdout of Ukraine's defense in the southern port city. Also on Sunday, Ukrainian officials accused Russia of attempting to storm the giant steel plant. It added that this comes despite Russian President Vladimir Putin's comments last week that the complex does not need to be taken. Ukraine's Armed Forces Command explained that Russian forces were hitting the plant with air and artillery bombardments. It added that Moscow is firing and performing offensive operations in the area while conducting airstrikes and civilian infrastructure at the same time. Ukraine's officials explained that an estimated 100,000 people remain trapped in Mariupol and over 20,000 people in the city have died so far since the onset of Russia's invasion. The mayor of the city said that they are witnessing, quote, the greatest war crime of the 21st century, stressing that the rest of the world needs to respond to stop the genocide by any means possible. Against his backdrop, a senior White House official highlighted in a televised interview on Sunday that Washington has been reviewing all possible means to hold Moscow accountable for what's happening in Ukraine. Pundits say this could even include the possibility of designating Russia a state sponsor of terrorism, which Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky has recently asked President Joe Biden to do. It is a critical moment as we mark two months into the war in Ukraine. An advisor to the Ukrainian president confirms that U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken and Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin were in Kyiv meeting with Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky. It was the first time since the conflict began that any cabinet-level official has set foot in Ukraine. An advisor to Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky said U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken had arrived in Kyiv on Sunday and was holding talks with the country's leader. Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin was also expected in the Ukrainian capital on Sunday, marking the highest level visit to Ukraine by U.S. officials since the start of the Russian invasion two months ago. An aide to Zelensky told NBC News that Ukrainian officials plan to ask Blinken and Austin for more powerful weapons, such as anti-missile and anti-aircraft systems. The White House has not confirmed any visit by the two. The State Department and Pentagon declined to comment. In an emotional address at Kyiv's 1,000-year-old St. Sophia Cathedral, Zelensky vowed his country would overcome dark times. Don't let rage destroy us from the inside. Turn it into our accomplishments on the outside. Turn it into a kind of force to defeat the powers of evil. Many across Ukraine observed Orthodox Easter on Sunday in bombed-out churches, including in Kharkiv, where several residents have also taken shelter in a church basement. Others braved conditions in the besieged port city of Mariupol to celebrate the holiday. In Mariupol, Ukrainian officials said that Russian forces attempted to storm the Azovstal steel plant, a main Ukrainian stronghold for the last of the city's defenders. 
Ukrainian presidential aide Oleksiy Arestovic said in a video address released by Zelensky's office on Sunday that Ukraine was offering Russia a special round of negotiations to be held in Mariupol to discuss the fate of the civilians and Ukrainian troops still trapped in the city. Now over in France, Emmanuel Macron comfortably defeated far-right rival Marine Le Pen, heading off a political earthquake for Europe, but acknowledging dissatisfaction with his first term and saying that would seek to make amendments. French President Emmanuel Macron won re-election on Sunday, defeating his far-right opponent Marine Le Pen by a comfortable margin, heading off what would have been a political earthquake. In a speech below the Eiffel Tower, Macron acknowledged those on the political left who voted for him reluctantly, only in order to prevent the far-right candidate from winning. Many of our compatriots voted for me not out of support for my ideas, but to block those of the extreme right. I want to thank them, and I know that I have a duty towards them in the years to come. Macron supporters cheered and waved French and EU flags as the results rolled in. On the outskirts of Paris, dejected Le Pen supporters booed the election outcome. Farther north, Le Pen fans expressed unbridled anger as they view Macron as an elitist with contempt for ordinary people. Le Pen conceded the race not long after the polls closed, but vowed to keep up the fight with the June parliamentary elections in mind. The French are showing tonight a wish for a strong counterpower against Emmanuel Macron. The match is not completely over, since in a few weeks the legislative elections will take place. Opposition parties on the right and left will immediately start a major push to try to vote in a parliament and government opposed to Macron, whose margin of victory looked to be tighter than when he first beat Le Pen five years ago, underlining how many French remain unimpressed with him and his domestic record. In what may be a sign of things to come, police fired tear gas at demonstrators Sunday night. Protests over Macron's pro-business reforms plagued his first five years in office. Despite the social discontent, though, the 44-year-old became the first French president in 20 years to win a second term. EU allies were pleased, hailing the centrist candidate's victory as a reprieve. Following 2020's Brexit, the 2016 election of Donald Trump, and the rise of a new generation of nationalist leaders. European leaders were quick to congratulate French President Emmanuel Macron for his election victory over his far-right rival, some reflecting relief at avoiding a political shock in one of the European Union's most pivotal countries. A vocal Euro enthusiast, Emmanuel Macron chose to play the European anthem as he made his way to the Champ de Mars. In the lead up to the vote, he had painted the choice between he and Le Pen as a referendum on Europe. It's no surprise then that Macron's win was welcomed by EU allies. German Chancellor Olaf Scholz, with whom Macron held his first phone call after re election, congratulated him on Twitter. He wrote, your constituents also sent a strong commitment to Europe today. I'm pleased that we will continue our positive cooperation. Ursula von der Leyen, the European Commission president, said, I look forward to continuing our excellent cooperation. Together we will move France and Europe forward. Meanwhile, Spanish Prime Minister Pedro Sanchez said it was a win for democracy and for Europe. France currently holds the rotating presidency of the Council of the EU, a testing time amid war in Ukraine. Macron has spearheaded efforts to defuse the crisis. Other issues Macron will be looking to tackle in his next term include reducing the bloc's dependence on imported energy, as well as the creation of an EU defence project. Wildfire season in U.S. began earlier than normal this year and now it is spreading to unexpected places. We have been reporting on wildfires in southwest in the U.S., but now they are fighting fires in places like Florida and Nebraska, where a fast-moving blaze turns deadly. Tonight, out of control. A rare and deadly wildfire surging across Tornado Alley. 
Authorities say a 66-year-old volunteer fire spotter was killed when this cluster broke out Friday near Cambridge, Nebraska. Along the Kansas border, this fire spreading fast, already ripping across more than 50,000 acres, driven by powerful 50-mile-an-hour winds and bone-dry brush. Nebraska's fire outbreak is burning in at least five counties. 11 firefighters injured so far. The National Guard called in to assist. In New Mexico, states of emergency across nearly half a dozen counties. Fires scattered across the state, threatening hundreds of homes. Officials warning, get out of harm's way. The governor saying half the state is now on high alert. We experienced a combination of conditions that quite frankly is unprecedented in New Mexico history. In Arizona, crews no closer to containing the ever-expanding tunnel fire, wind-driven flames chewing through more than 20,000 acres near Flagstaff. Hot, dry, and windy weather in the forecast could only make it all much worse. This year's reign of fire, off to an early start and primed to spread. It's going to a short commercial break. We'll be back soon with more World News. Welcome back to World News Tonight. With South Korea experiencing a substantial drop in its daily COVID-19 figures, local health authorities are lifting more and more antivirus measures. For, next, for the next week, people will be permitted to eat at sports stadiums, movie theatres and on public transport. A return to normal. This is what we've all been waiting for in Korea. And we're starting to get there with lower COVID-19 daily tallies. On Friday, the country saw the number of new infections stay below 100,000 for the second straight day. The exact figure stood at 81,058. As the country's daily average COVID-19 tally is now 40 percent lower than that of last week, authorities are continuing to lift antivirus measures. From this week, social gathering caps and business operation hour curfews were scrapped. And from next week, authorities are set to reclassify COVID-19, which is currently at the highest risk level of one, as level two. Accordingly, they're going to allow people to eat or drink at movie theaters, indoor sports stadiums, and on public transport from Monday. They're also to decide whether to lift outdoor mask-wearing mandates. Also, with May around the corner, which is also known as a family month here in Korea due to Children's Day and Parents' Day falling that month, the country is set to allow in-person visits to nursing homes. Because many residents of nursing homes are deemed at high risk from the virus, all in-person visits have been prohibited. Now that the virus has been relatively tamed, authorities have decided to allow visits from April 30th to May 22nd. But the prime minister on Friday clarified that lifting measures does not mean that the threat of the virus has been lifted as well. That's why he asked local governments and individuals to remain alert. It's up to individuals and business owners to prevent the spread of the virus once we lift most regulations. When eating indoors, refrain from talking and moving around. Wear your masks indoors at all times and frequently ventilate the area. He also asked local governments to prescribe more of the antiviral pills as authorities consider expanding eligibility for the treatment. The prime minister also asked seniors to get their second booster shots. We have some good news for you. A childlike robot has been designed to mimic the critical medical symptoms of children to help train dental workers in Japan. How should a dentist react if a child does this? This or this? This humanoid robot is helping to train pediatric dentists in Japan by simulating a child's response to dental treatment, from tantrums to critical medical symptoms. Yusuke Ishii is the engineering division director of Temsuk. The medical workers really need to experience medical emergencies. It is important that they experience a situation where something goes wrong, and that's what it can simulate. The robot, named Pedioroid, is linked to a tablet which is programmed with different medical conditions. The user can send signals to air cylinders within the robot's joints to move its entire body, mouth and tongue. This allows it to display physical reactions and facial expressions. More importantly, the robot can simulate signs of a medical emergency, such as convulsion and heart failure. It was co-developed by Japanese robotics startup Timsuk and a local dental school. They wanted to address a lack of clinical dental training to treat children. 
It is difficult to get experience in pediatric dentistry because there are no opportunities to practice. In addition, there is the risk that children will move wildly because with children, when their medical condition suddenly worsens, it's hard for them to express that situation. So it is necessary to have the experience and knowledge to monitor and treat the patients. But the medical workers don't have this training opportunity, so they administer the treatment in real situations without enough training. So we develop this so that they can practice on a simulation. The robot costs approximately $195,000. Tim hopes to develop it further so it can help people in other childcare industries, such as elementary school teachers and pediatricians. Thousands of Argentine farmers protested in Buenos Aires against President Alberto Fernandez, whose policies to contain food prices to curb rampant inflation have been criticised by the agricultural sector. A long, slow procession of protesters trudges its way down a Buenos Aires street, making their voices heard. But this time in the city, these Argentine farmers are angry with the country's government. To curb rampant inflation, President Alberto Fernandez's administration recently intervened in the agricultural sector, curbing food prices and limiting meat exports. Protesters say the policies are counterproductive. Demonstrators also called for a greater reduction in taxes on food exports, which started under the previous conservative government of Mauricio Macri and have continued to rise under Fernandez, a leftist. Argentina has battled extremely high inflation for years, with levels reaching around 50% in 2021. Food policy has become a particularly delicate task for the government. In the past year, farmers have also protested against limits on meat exports that Fernandez eventually relaxed. Governor Ron DeSantis of Florida and state lawmakers have revoked a 55-year-old arrangement that gave Disney a special tax status and allowed it to essentially self-govern its 25,000-acre Disney World complex. Florida Governor Ron DeSantis on Friday signed a bill that strips Walt Disney of self-governing authority at its Orlando area parks. The bill was passed in retaliation for Disney's opposition to a new law that limits the teaching of LGBTQ issues in school. It was really an aberration. No individual or no company in Florida is treated this way. It would eliminate the special governing jurisdiction that allows the company to operate Walt Disney World Resort as its own city and thus provide services such as firefighting, power, water and roads within Orange and Osceola counties. While the financial impact on the company and the state is uncertain, Richard Auksher, a senior policy associate at the Urban Brookings Tax Policy Center, described the move as a political tantrum. Disney initially did not publicly oppose the LGBTQ legislation last month, dubbed the Don't Say Gay Bill by critics, which bans classroom instruction on sexual orientation or gender identity for children in kindergarten through third grade. But after the company condemned the law and said it would suspend political donations in Florida pending a review, Republicans hit back. Some even showed up to the resort to protest. Disney did not immediately comment on the bill's signing Friday. What remains unclear, says Systematic Ventures CEO Max Wolf, is who will be more harmed by Disney losing its special status, Disney or Florida taxpayers. The bill will not take effect until June of 2023, giving the two sides time to adjust to the new reality. Welcome back to World News Tonight. For more news, let's take you around the world in a minute. The European Central Bank is reportedly getting ready to end its decade-long bond buying program as soon as possible and to raise interest rates as soon as July, but no later than September to try and deal with inflation. Shanghai is seeing a rising number of COVID-related deaths. The city has been in strict lockdown for the past four weeks, with many residents not allowed to leave their homes at all during that time. Indonesia, the world's largest exporter of palm oil, is halting exports of the cooking oil starting Thursday, citing a need to quell domestic shortages and rising prices. However, as one of the Indonesia's biggest customers, it's feared Jakarta's move will negatively impact consumer prices in South Korea. A Japanese woman born at dawn of the 20th century and believed to have been the world's oldest person died at the age of 119. Japan has a dwindling and rapidly aging population. As of September, the country had 86,510 centenarians and 9 out of every 10 were women. 
China National Space Administration said that the country is planning more than 60 space launches in 2022 as it looks to further engage in extraterrestrial exploration and complete the building of the International Space Station. And that's all the news we got for you tonight. Join us again tomorrow for more news around the globe. In case you have missed to watch any of the stories we add tonight, you can always rewatch by catching us on our YouTube page, youtube.com slash English. We're leaving you tonight with visuals of Australians lined the streets of Sydney to watch thousands of past and present military personnel march in the annual Anzac Day Parade. Thank you for watching us again. Have a good night.